microphone out of here in case I want to dance. And I'm going to have to fight here, so. All right. <laughs> the three circles represent the progression of Jesus from Son of God in eternity uh, as uh, all the way through, and then it has some particulars that we mentioned, and then it has some other things. All right. So we'll start with the eternal Son of God. Before the foundation of the world, Jesus was the Son of God, and he was eternal and is eternal in that sense. And um, again, there, is, um, there was no birth. He was not birthed. All right, so then the progression is then he becomes incarnated, and as such, the scriptures refer to him as the only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Um, and uh, he was born, he was born in a manger, okay, when he came. All right, then the only begotten went to the cross and died, okay. So there is the death, and, that, and the resurrection out of that was more than just a resurrection. It was a, in other words, it wasn't a resurrection of the only begotten. It was the death of the only begotten, which we talked about and we'll talk about more and more as we go, to bring forth the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn son. Okay. Now there is so much to talk about, not tonight, on this thing of the firstborn son because um, it, you, you can get tripped up on several fronts in relationship to it, all right? So we'll, we, have to, we have to see some things in relationship to that. All right, so then the firstborn, um, for the only begotten, there was the cross, okay? But for the firstborn... He's full of crosses, but he's also, we're in him, okay? So the amount of self-giving in, in this firstborn son, in, in termed in Christ, or, or new man, or the body of Christ, all of those terms relate to all of us being part of this resurrection, whereas... Um, well, let's just name it at that. All right. And then as the, the progression of the firstborn son, which is us also in him, having his nature, being born again, and that's what he was. He was born again out of death. Okay? Because there was a death. And he's born again, but this time different. He's not the only begotten Son of God. He's the firstborn, born again. Out of the, the manger was first, this is again. Get it? <laughs> All right. So um, that life and that nature is eternal, which we'll see down here. The Lamb in us and us in the Lamb will just continue in that spirit. That's why I put all these crosses in there. That spirit is eternal, okay? And guess what? This lamb, this firstborn son that gives himself constantly, not just one time as the only begotten, but constantly, is our life. He's the one that we ask to come inside of us. Okay? <laughs> so, so this, so... Here's your future right here, not, not just this one. this one. This cross that the only begotten died on settled a lot of stuff. You died once and for all for sin. Here Jesus did, and, and there, there are things that are settled and done. But here, inside of him, he didn't cease being the Lamb of God. He didn't cease being the, the, the son that of the Father's love, but now he is in a form that has us in him, okay? If you want any 
real good stuff on that. Just read the first three chapters of Ephesians because all it talks about is in him, in whom, in Christ. It uses that terminology all the time. All right, so the important thing to see in what I just went over is the eternal Son of God who never was born came and became a man and was incarnated. He was born in a manger and he began to be called the only begotten Son because he was the only one of this kind of being. Okay. Okay. He was completely different from us in, in uh, his spirit and in his nature. Okay, so, but he went into death at the cross so that the Father, and I don't know how much we're going to get into tonight, but so that the Father could have many sons in the image of that son. Okay. And the scriptures declare that, and we'll look at all the scriptures eventually. All right. And also so that this spirit would, you know, um, fill all of us. All right. So once the only begotten son died, then he was born again in a different form. Okay. And with a different emphasis. Over here is the only begotten. He's going to heal somebody outside of him. He's going to minister to somebody outside of him. He's going to bless somebody outside of him. But over here, we have that same Jesus inside of us. And, and whatever he would do for people here, that didn't mean they would change. It doesn't mean that the world was really that different after Jesus came. But it is different now because because we have his life and all hope for you and me to be anything that could bring glory to God is Christ in you. D did you hear me? I said all, all hope. Okay. So, so Jesus was born again, but you have to understand that the actual eternal son of God was also the only begotten, was, is also the firstborn son, but the firstborn son, as Colossians talks about, and as our class on Thursday nights talks about, is very important that we understand that, because if we don't, we don't see any of this. We just see the Gospels and Jesus walking and blessing, and we go, well, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be a healer. <laughs> That's what we think. Or I want to, you know, whatever. Instead of, I want the cross to work in me so that his life can come forth. That's the plan. That's the goal. All right. So, let's see if we can see a mark down here. I don't know how well your vision is there. But this says eternity passed on the bottom. Okay. And I mark that, um, you know, wherever... The, I guess I, I can put it that way. This chart is not made to reflect the times and seasons of man. This chart is made to reflect the mind of God as he saw things transpiring. Okay. So to him, it's either eternity past, time with his son in it, or the resurrection and the life, which is the firstborn. The firstborn is the resurrection and the life, okay? So he's the resurrection in that he came up from the dead with us in him. So he is the resurrection. He's the life in that that lamb in us is what's going to keep going. Does that make sense? All right. So the bottom line then is eternity passed and it stops, again, not reflecting human history, but God's view of his son. Eternity passed ends and time begins when the eternal son of God stepped out of eternity and stepped into time as the only begotten son. Okay? In God's mind, that's his timeline. 
in our mind, well, you know, there was grease and they did something and, you know, then, you know, and God's going, I don't care about all that, <laughs> you know. All right. So, so when he stepped out of eternity past, he stepped into time, then the only begotten came and began to minister. So we're talking about ministering in time. He died on a cross in time. But when the firstborn came up, and this may be hard for you to understand, and you may not agree, and you don't have to agree with this, but when the firstborn was raised from the dead, that's when eternity actually began. Think of him. Don't think of, think of the one raised. He's not sitting in time going, well, I wonder what time it is. He is eternally raised, and we are eternally in him now. I know you're trying to be in him, but stop it. If you're born again, you're in him, all right? And so here's where eternity actually, eternity future actually begins with his resurrection. And we just enter into that. That's called, that, see if this little cross is you right there? Whenever you got born again on your date timeline, not God's, you know, well, it was uh, June Ninth at 3.02, you know, at McDonald's. You know, well, he didn't care about that because once you step out of time, you step into eternal life, which is him. Okay? So, um, okay, I guess I covered everything on there. Now, let's look at some scriptures that will help us to really understand this. All right, let's turn to uh, Psalm 2, the second psalm. All right, verse, let's start with, let's just, yeah, let's start with verse 5 and go through 7. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay, you can't say he's talking about the eternal son of God because he was never begotten. He was just always his son. Amen? Okay. So when he was born in a manger, was that the day that he was begotten? This day have I begotten thee. Okay, well, the answer is no. He was already still his son in that form, but he was, uh, but you could say, well, I mean, you can say it's his son because he was born, but there is a, a begetting that is new. I guess that's the only way I know how to put that. So let's look at these. I mean, these verses are referring to the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? Are you sure? Uh, it is talking about the resurrection of Jesus out from being the only begotten, okay? Um, and it's talking about being born into the firstborn, okay? Um, let's look at verse 7. Again, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day, this day have I begotten thee. So... This is the day that Jesus got born again. All right, so here's the deal. I see that some of you might be skeptical. Good, good, that's good. Be skeptical. It's always, folks, don't swallow everything anybody says. Take it to the Lord, get in the word. Okay, I'm intentionally starting at this place right here just to mess with you, just to see, you know, you should be a little skeptical at this point, okay? So, so let's read Psalm 2 now, uh, down through verse 7 again. 
Why do the heathen rage? So we're, we're actually beginning Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Okay, so do you see the death and resurrection? Okay, do you see that this death and resurrection is of Christ unto becoming the firstborn. Okay, good. You don't all fully. Or you would like to. Are you going to acknowledge that, yeah, that's probably it, because, Randy, you always do this stuff to us. But um, it's important that we, again, now go through some of this and look at it. All right? Um, <clears throat> so let's first look at the plot and the crucifixion of Jesus by religion and government and by the heathen. Ready? <clears throat> Verse 1 again and through 3. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. Okay. Can you kind of see, can you at least say, yeah, okay, maybe, da, 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 da. I, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be skeptical so that I can convince you with new, the New Testament, okay? So still be skeptical. All right, you ready to have the New Testament just blatantly tell you that that's exactly what this psalm is about? Yes. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> Acts chapter 4 and verse 15. All right, so this, this is, in this chapter, they've, they've um, brought some of the disciples in and the Sanhedrin, which is the religious um, court. It's the higher ups of religion, of uh, the Jewish religion, to uh, examine them, to uh, warn them, um, because people are starting to get interested in Jesus, all right? So, verse 15, talking about they, that's the Sanhedrin or the, the, the judges. But when they had commanded them to, uh, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? <clears throat> For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them. Okay, why do the heathen rage? Okay, Randy, you could take any scripture that says threaten, and you can twist it. And we know you're a twister, like we did last summer. Anyway, uh, but uh, that they speak no more in this name Verse 18, and they call them and command them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Verse 22, for the man was above 40 years old of whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went their own, uh, to their own company and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, 
Thou art God, why ha uh, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Um, uh, for the truth against the, thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel hath determined to be done. Okay, beforehand. So, so what is it saying? It is, they're not saying that their situation per se is the fulfillment of Psalm, of the second Psalm. They're, yeah, they're quoting it. They're saying Jesus' death and crucifixion was. That this is the fulfillment of Psalm 2, first verse. Okay. Now are you believe in me a little better? Just a little bit. Okay. Well, we'll keep moving. Okay. So, so you see there's all this threatening going on. And then it says uh, reported, they reported what the chief priests and the elders did. And then... Um, uh, and then, then it says, uh, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. Okay, so his holy child Jesus is the only begotten son that was put to death. Because why did it say his holy child Jesus? He didn't say his firstborn son that's sitting at my right hand. And he didn't say my eternal son that's not a, not a holy child. He said, they put the only begotten son to death. All right? So that means that Psalm 2 is telling us the story and is showing us the progression to, to the firstborn and to what the plan of God had in mind. <clears throat> so then he also says... Um, uh, the kings of the earth stood up, rulers gathered together against his Christ, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, <clears throat> and the people uh, of Israel. Why do the nations, why, do they, why are they doing this? They're doing this to crucify him, all right, to get rid of him. <clears throat> um, all right, so... These verses are the fulfillment of the death of the firstborn. And that's not all because we haven't got to verse 5 through 7 yet, which talks about who? The birth of the firstborn. The born again, not, not physical birth, but the coming forth of the firstborn. <clears throat> All right, so verse 4 of, sorry, back to Psalm 2. I, if I didn't tell you to keep your place there, I'm so sorry. So if we go anywhere else, keep your place in Psalm 2 for a little bit. <clears throat> All right, Psalm 2, verse 4. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. All right. So <clears throat> he laughs at them in their derision. They think they have destroyed this son. Okay. I wrote, but they actually made the way for his exaltation as firstborn. All right. So I want to picture something for you here. If this is true, which the New Testament says it is true, that these scriptures in Psalm 2 represent death, burial, and re resurrection and exaltation of Jesus in his various forms, including his birth, you know, uh, in a manger, that holy child, Jesus, <clears throat> then they are um, showing us the heart of God in relationship to what was in his plan. <clears throat> but it's also showing us this contrast. It's showing a contrast of earth and the people in earth and God. Okay, so let's, 
we've already looked at the contrast of the, the, the Pharisees and the people, the priests and all that, the heathen rage. Because in God's eyes, you go, well, these are holy priests. And God says, you're heathen. Because you don't know me. You know, I mean, it would be to know me, the, the Lord would say, to know me, not to know religion and think that the things that I've said pertain to a religion that you formed and think that that's what I, that's me. That's not me. Um, <clears throat> so, so let's look at a contrast of the contrast of God's people on earth and God. All right. So. We have Jesus hanging on the cross. He's the only begotten son. All right. So Mary is there with John. The rest of the disciples have run and hid. This is bad. This is, you know, Jesus is hung on a cross. He'll die up there. They're weeping. They're carrying on. Okay. Quick flash. 100 million miles away into heaven. God. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He's, he knows what's going on. He's not freaked out. Jesus came. What You know, <clears throat> remember when he was in the garden praying? Father, save me from this hour, but for this hour, I came unto this hour, so don't save me from it, you know. Um, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. Okay. So, and I've often said, I don't know if anybody even agrees with that, but I've often said that Jesus, you know, I mean, we know this. Jesus and God are one, right? God is one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they're one God, okay? And, um, and for it to say, Jesus saying, not my will, but thine be done, would either mean that he's out of whack with God or the order and the way of God is you don't do your own thing, you do his thing, and he won't do his own thing, he'll do his thing, and, and the Holy Spirit comes and he won't testify of himself, he'll testify of you, and Jesus won't testify of himself, he'll testify of the Father, not my will but thine be done. And somebody sitting there like if Peter, if Peter really understood that, he'd go, wait a minute, your will's the same. It's exactly the same. You, you exactly want the same. So why would you say not your will? Because you want what he wants. And he would say, if I had the choice of the two being exactly the same, I would choose the Father's, not my own. Yeah? Jalapeno? <clears throat> All right. So you have this picture of earth we're groaning and weeping, and this is a horrible event. This is terrible. This is, you know, in the, in the mind of Christians today, we go, it's the most glorious event ever in that it released the firstborn so that we could be found in him, so that we could be brought together into him instead of him just being the only one, like, like, a, like a great magician coming down here and doing stuff and then leaving and we go well wasn't it great oh yeah i think we got that on the road to emmaus we still get it wasn't that great wish i could have been there i remember i was in bible school somebody said man don't you wish you lived when jesus did i said no i like living in him now i don't want to walk with him well, you know, you could talk to him. I talk to him all the time. You know? I mean, he's every bit as real to me. In fact, he's more real to me than a lot of people because a lot of people aren't real. You get it? <laughs> you know, he's, he is more real to me. So, anyway. So, you know, I've, I've seen the picture many times of weeping and everything and um, and not recognizing, you know, uh, like on the road to Emmaus, we thought he was the one. We thought this was it, but the cross messed everything up. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. 
It fulfilled everything that was supposed to be fulfilled. So God's sitting in heaven. He's laughing. <laughs> you know, he's watching him drive the nails in his hands. And he's going, this is all for planned. You know, he came to die. You know, this was his purpose. I mean, he was, when he was born, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's what you wrap dead bodies in. You know, so, you know, there's this whole thing of, of God is, is uh, he's laughing, but he's also looking at the people that are doing this, and he's going, this is, you know, he sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Um, again, what I wrote, they think that they have destroyed him, but have actually made the way for his exaltation. So they're looking at it like, we got rid of him. The only begotten, the only one on the earth. He walks, he talks, and tells all this stuff and does miracles and makes us look bad. Let's kill him. We killed him. It's over with. And God's going, it's just begun. This thing's going to fill the earth, you know. And you Romans, you're not even going to be around anymore. <laughs> you know. So... Um, but remembering, they kill the only begotten. Now, let me say this at this stage. It is very important that you realize that the only begotten son is the one who died. Okay? All right. It's important. There's, now, I'm going to build on that again, as I, I, not tonight, but I will build on that and I will show some things that are important because um, I, don't want to, I don't want to muddy the water yet. But up to this point and with this chart, the only begotten son is the one who dies. And the firstborn is the, the, is the one who comes forth and, and is born again. Okay? All right. We'll explain minute because there's really a lot to it. Wow. I mean, I was, even before we got ready to, we were just about ready to eat lunch, a uh, dinner tonight, and I was just waiting and just uh, reading the word. And the Spirit of God was just talking to me about this, and I'm just going, oh, God, you know. And, and some of you know, but, you know, last couple of months I've been having problems with my eyes and problems reading and problems with stuff I've never had. I've always had great vision right up till just recently. And, um, and as the Lord was sharing all this with me, because it's like the eyes of my understanding. He's not even going to my eyes per se, you know. And I'm, I just started I, I, as I always do, I thank him and rejoice even if I'm having a problem, you know, and in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I was doing that and then I just stopped and I went, oh my God, Lord, if this is, if this is my eyes are getting dim in the natural, but the eyes of my understanding, which do seem to be, to me, I'm seeing more. I am being brought deeper into his heart than, than ever before. It's like, and it's like fast that he's doing this in my life. I just went, take me all the way to being totally blind physically. If you, if to, to whatever degree I'm going blind, you're opening my spiritual eyes to be able to see you. I, I can live with that. You know, what a wonder. <laughs> Praise God. I mean, it, I, I can't put it into words. I seriously can't. I was giggling for joy, genuinely, just a few hours ago. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so verse 5, and we'll go ahead and do verse 5 through 7 again. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Okay, so I, you know, here's the way that I usually do that. I'm going, Lord, that doesn't fit with the, the lamb spirit that I know that you have. You know, everything's been lining up right on down. And then you go, 
Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And I'm going, this is just, this sounds like a little mean-spirited thing there. And, well, I know, first of all, I know he's not that. Second of all, I, I'm not going to doubt the scriptures. I'm going to doubt my understanding of what that's trying to communicate. So I did what probably we all should do. I read the next verse. Okay. And he says, I shall um, vex them in my sore displeasure. I shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure, saying this, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill Zion. That's what's vexing them. He's not going, yeah, yeah, and taking a sharp stick and jabbing them and tormenting them behind bars or something like that. He is raising the firstborn up. He's raised, he's exalted him. And said, this is my firstborn. This is my king. This is the one every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. And that's vexing them because they thought by putting the only begotten to death, that ended the whole thing. Is, is this good or what? Come on. I, mean, just, I was just bathing in this. Um, So again, it was at the cross that the only begotten son died. It was in resurrection that he was brought forth in a new birth as firstborn son. All right. So uh, let's go to verse 8 now. We just did 5 through 7. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. All right. Oh, boy. Um, we, we, you know, we tend to see things in light of our time, not God's. Our view, so we view it within history or we view it in uh, man's understanding, and we tend to miss so much of what the Lord is, is trying to say uh, which I find to be very, I, I find the Lord to be very clean and clear to the point in his thinking. And it's always a similar area. <clears throat> so we read this as, uh, as for me, I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So we see that as, okay, God exalted Jesus, and, and in our minds, it's neither, well, it might even be the eternal son again. <clears throat> we say, he was the eternal son, he's the best manager, he's the best one to be in charge, how da 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 so exalt him and put him down here, but that's not what God did. This eternal son doesn't have any of us in him. Neither does the only begotten, and that's why he's the only. There, that firstborn son is where we find something greater. And what we find in there is they, those that were heathen and those were the othermost parts of the world. Okay, and I'll just, I'll just give a little. Oh, should I? Okay, I'll wait. Um, so, as long as he was the only begotten son, there were not many. So, one of the first things God said to Abraham is, I will make you a father of many. Okay, so the father is going to get many sons, and we'll, if, we're, we're not going to get to that tonight, but, um, and he's only going to get those sons if his only begotten son dies, is given on Mount Moriah. 
when he does, then God says, that's it. You, there will be as many as the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky. That's it. The only begotten died because that's what, what Abraham took with him up on Mount Moriah when God said, take now thy son, thine only son, the son whom thou lovest only begotten thine only son and offer him for a sacrifice and so he takes him up there and he when he sets him on that altar and raises his hand God says hold up now I know now I know now now I know and as far as you can, you can, you know, I can hear his heart saying, as far as I'm concerned, when you laid Isaac on that altar, your only son, your, in your mind, well, let's just say this, your only son, your firstborn son. You go, ah, come on, come on, argue with me. Uh, tell me about Ishmael. No. Isaac is his firstborn son between him and Sarah, and the promise always going to be, be there. He's the only begotten son when he takes him up there. Do you understand that? That's why God's sending him up there. Abraham, do you want the promise? Yes. This is how I do it. This is the path. Take now your son, your only begotten son, just like I will. And offer him. And when, when he laid him on that altar and he raised that knife, he because the, the way the scriptures see it, he was going to do it. God said, that's, that's good enough. And the, and the thing that he highlights when he's saying that isn't just that they're going to be a father of a multitude now. It's coming now. It was that you took your firstborn, your only begotten, the one that you love and offered him. In God's mind, Isaac, the only begotten, died that day. And when he got up from that altar, he came up as the firstborn among many. The firstborn. Isaac was the firstborn. Not, not when he came out of the womb, so all of this we'll have to get into. But when he came through death, when he was given in death from being the only to the first, and then when he arose off of that altar, God said, now is coming all the fulfillment of everything I told you. It's no longer, get this, it's no longer of promise anymore. It's going to happen. You've held on to the promise. Any of you guys just holding on to promises? Well, guess what? You need to quit. You need to do that by, by realizing that that has been settled, and now you're in the firstborn. See, they're not promises anymore. It's reality. But if you make them promises, you're still in the old covenant. All right? So, what an incredible thing. Why, you know, uh, I shall have them in derision and da 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 da. I laugh because they don't even know what they're doing by putting my only begotten son there. I'm going to release way more on them. And he says, ask of me. Whatever sons, whatever you want, whatever amount, the fulfillment is here. The death has happened. The firstborn has now come forth. And this is why the other night I was talking to some of you and I said, you need to get your identity straight because you're still either praying to the eternal God way up there as if that's all he is or you're looking at Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospels because that's, you can practically formulate that, 
but in the, the epistles is where you don't have hardly any mention of Jesus of Nazareth. It's always this firstborn son, the one who died, the one who brought us forth, the new identity that we have in him. If any man be in firstborn son, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God. And Okay, but that's just, that's just verses and that's just teaching. Lord, it's no reality to me. Well, then get in the scriptures and get the Holy Spirit stirred up to, to want to reveal the son, this firstborn son in you. That's the, that's the plan. Because anything short of that is short of that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it didn't, it didn't just say you've sinned. We're coming short of the glory of it. And are we okay with that? You know? So, let's see. Hmm. Well, I'm going to read a scripture that I'll start with next time. But before I do that, let me see here. Um, instead of turning there, let me give you the reference. You can look at it later and just listen to it. <clears throat> the reference is Galatians 3, verse 7 through 9. So don't look at it yet. Just, just listen to what this says. Know ye, therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, <laughs> preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Oh, my Lord. We'll take that apart and look at it. But it has to be looked at in light of the second psalm, because it's literally quoting from, from the thoughts that are coming there and many other places throughout the New Testament. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, and we thank you for the Spirit of God who wants to just break apart the scriptures and show us life instead of, instead of words and letters, uh, and to, to breathe fullness and to impart your heart and your mind and to uh, make us more than Christians on the earth trying to serve Jesus of Nazareth, but members of the life that gave himself, members of that spirit that we all could be partakers. We thank you. We love you. We praise you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, Kelly, you have an announcement that you want to make?